Okay, so we're looking at um, Lot, Isaac, and Christ. We looked at the first point. God declares believers to be as holy as he is. The very moment they repent and trust Christ, it's a one-time and permanent. Number two, um, God alone provided our rescue as pictured in the lamb that died in Isaac's place. So take your Bibles and let's go over to Genesis chapter 22. And we're just kind of continuing to track through and looking at the pictures of Christ in the Old, in the Old Testament. So as we previously had left Abraham and, and Sarah, um, they didn't have a child. And so now 25 years later, God gave, God gave Abraham and Sarah a son just as he promised. And they, and they, named, they, named, him, they named him Isaac. So why was Isaac their son of promise? Why was Isaac their son of promise? Getting back to 101, by one or established 101, why was Isaac their son of promise? Yes, and so God fulfilled it, didn't he? So he was that son of promise. How else was he their son of promise? Think through the ramifications. Think of the promises that God made to Abraham. Your offspring will be as numerous as? As the stars. And so that promise was bound up in who? Who was the fulfillment? Who was the beginning fulfillment of that promise? Isaac was, wasn't he? Okay, how else was Isaac, even something even more profound than that, how was Isaac their son of promise? Abraham and Sarah, born righteous, right? No sin, the moment they were born, correct? No, they were cut off from God. Who did they need? They needed a deliverer. Who was the deliverer coming through? Isaac. So Isaac was their son of promise to, to take care of their sin problem, and so that was absolutely necessary. So imagine their joy. How would we react if we waited 25 years for a son that we knew God was going to promise? Can you imagine? And then ladies, could you imagine having your first son at the age of 90? Boy, that was a miracle. Can you imagine the stir that that caused in the community? Like, wow, this, this 90-year-old lady had her first child. Just astounding to think about it. So we too should be overjoyed because Isaac is our son of promise. Think about that. As we insert ourselves in the story, as we track through the story, God made the first declaration of the, of the deliverer to Adam and Eve in their sin. And so as we walk through the story, God is declaring uh, the deliverer is coming, the deliverer is coming, the deliverer is coming. And when, when God makes a declaration to Abraham that through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed, we should be sitting, we would, if we were following through the story, we would be sitting on the edge of our seat. Because this is our son of promise. Our deliverer is coming through Isaac, just as God declared. And so we've got to see the whole thing in the sequence as God's laid it out. So in light of this, imagine Abraham's shock when a few years later God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Now by this point in time, uh, they guesstimate that, that Abraham was probably about 120 years old and Isaac was probably about 20. So let's go to Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 3. And go ahead, our designated reader over there, please. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Okay, so did Abraham, so in verse 1, it says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Did Abraham know this, there was a test? Did Abraham know this was a test? Well, it says there in my Bible, did Abraham, so did Abraham know this? No, no he didn't know. He had to step out in obedience, right? A incredible. And where was, the sa where was he to sacrifice Isaac? Where was he to sacrifice Isaac? Where God would show him. But actually, does it, say, does it actually says here, in the mountain, which mountain? Moriah. And it's huge that we, that we, we understand that. So early the next morning, Abram set out. No delay. So now put yourself, put yourself in Abram's shoes. You just received your son of promise. Now you've been enjoying him for the last 20 years. And so everything, all the future promises are bound up in this young man. And then wham, God speaks to you and says, I want you to go and sacrifice him. What are you going to do? Would you get up as quickly as Abraham did the next day without delay? 
Like this is a real person, real thought, real emotion, real love for his son, just like you and I would have. And this is what God was asking him. Yes. And he must have been convinced, absolutely convinced, and knowing the voice of his God to, to understand for sure positive that this was God speaking to him and there was no questions, no doubts about it. Like, this is huge. Like, we read through this story and think, oh, okay, well, so what? No. This is real. What did he tell Sarah? I, scripture doesn't say, but what, do you think he told Sarah? Isaac, as we look later on the scripture, Isaac had no idea what was, hap- was going to happen. Sorry? <laughs> yeah. My wife would have stopped me. I'd, you're off my dead body. You're taking my son anywhere. But uh, anyway, so but notice, but notice Abram's complete trust in God. For instance, he took only the knife, wood, and the fire. He didn't take a, a backup substitute just in case God didn't come through. Like he just took the wood and the fire and the knife. There's no backup substitute. His complete confidence in God that God would provide. And then, then three days later, for journeying to Moriah, we, in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 22, he told the servants, we will worship, and then we will come back to you. You thought that uh, even if you killed Isaac, you would die? Yes. So Genesis, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about Abram felt that even if he killed him, then, then God would raise him back to death. And then think to Isaac later on when Isaac said, hey, father, there's the wood and the fire, but where's the lamb? What does Abraham respond? God himself will provide the lamb. So what do you think that trip was like for Abraham? No idea what God was up to. God was silent. God told him to go and to sacrifice, but there was no word from God as to this being a test or what was going to happen. What was that three-day journey like? As you, yeah, one step in front of the other and com- complete confidence in God. Would you go empty-handed if you're Abraham? And what would you say to your son when you said, hey, Dad, where's the lamb? What would, how would, you, what would you say? So let's read again how God provided a perfect substitute to die in Isaac's place in verses 9 to 13. Um, go ahead and read that, please. 9 when to 13. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. There, then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Well, so God in his grace provided what Abraham and and Isaac were helpless to provide. God required a death, and Abraham and Isaac both submitted themselves to it. And God in himself provided what they needed. Isn't Isn't his provision absolutely astounding timely absolutely timely and absolutely perfect perfect what they needed god too requires a death to pay for mankind's sin and his grace god gives us the choice the choice as to who will die ourselves or his substitute his perfect provision his substitute to die in his die in our place christ is the perfect lamb of god who died in place of sinners to take away their sin he didn't have to he willingly bore your sin and my sin upon himself up on the cross so abram had complete confidence that god would provide a substitute as he offered his son god didn't put him to shame he came through So think about this. As we came to understand our brokenness and our sin through the story of God's word, and as God was declaring, a deliverer is coming, a deliverer is coming, a deliverer, were we put to shame? Did God come through? How did he come through? How did he come through to meet our greatest greatest need? By sending Christ. Christ our perfect substitute at the exact right moment at the right sake time. So let's look at the connections between us and Abraham. Abraham and Sarah couldn't have a son. Their bodies were as good as dead. How were we the same? How were we the same? Abraham, or Abraham and Sarah, their bodies were as good as dead. They couldn't have a son. How were we the same? 
We were dead in our trespasses and sin. No way could we provide for ourselves. God alone conceived life within Sarah. How were we the same? How were we the same? God conceived life in Sarah? Yeah, God gave us life, eternal life through himself. God sent Isaac as he promised. How has God been the same for us? Did he not send Christ, our deliverer, just as he promised? We're not too different than Abraham, are we, really? Now, the connections between us and us as believers and Isaac while bound on the altar, Isaac recognized that he existed for God and he submitted himself to God to do as he pleased. We did the same the moment we repented of our sin, didn't we? We bowed before, we bowed before the holiness of God and we, 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 we bowed before him as God himself. Let me find my chart here. We bowed before, we acknowledged the holiness of God that demands us to be equally holy. Isaac agreed with God that his judgment on his sin was right. We did the same when we repented of our sin. Isaac, um, Isaac agreed, excuse me, Isaac admitted that he was helpless to help himself. He died, God didn't provide help outside of, him, outside of himself, and we did the same. Um, Isaac looked in faith to God to provide a substitute to die in his place. We did the same when we looked to Christ, and God provided. So how many substitute lambs did God provide for Isaac? to escape death on that altar. How many? Just one was sufficient, wasn't it? The same is true for us. Christ came as our one final substitute lamb. He died once and we were set free forever. And just like Isaac, we we escaped death in the lake of fire, accepted by God right now and forever. One lamb for Isaac, one lamb for you and I. There is still more absolute connection between God's, um, God's provision of Isaac and Christ as our substitute. Look at verse 14 of chapter 22. Go ahead and read that, please. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Okay, so as you stop and think about that, notice what Abraham said. So Abraham called that place, the Lord provided. Is that what it says in your verse? will provide. Hang on a second. Didn't God just, didn't God just provide for, for Isaac? So why is, why is he making a declaration the Lord will provide future tense? And why is it noticed on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided? There's a huge point here that we need to see and to see the connections. We've got to fast forward um, to the time of Solomon. We built the temple, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Notice what, notice what it says here. 2 Chron- uh, Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. A huge truth here that we've got to see. 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1. Just give a second to find it. Making these, connection, making these connection points through God's word because it's, it's just huge to see, this, see, to see what God is doing here. Go ahead and read chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite, the place provided by David. Okay, so where did Solomon, where did God have Solomon build a temple? Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah. So now hang on a second here. And where was, where was Isaac sacrificed? Is there, any, is there any connection between the two? What's the connections between God offering Isaac, off, telling Isaac to, or Abraham to offer Isaac on, on Mount Moriah and the temple being established there too? What's the connections? Same mountain. Same mountain. What was they needing here, and what was God providing here? Yes, a place for sacrifice for sin, wasn't it? And then think about it, and then later on, where in the world was our Lamb of God um, sacrificed? Where was he hung? Mount Moriah. Do you ever see, do you ever look at those connections before? As God brings all those things together. It's amazing how God orchestrates all these events to reveal who he is and his provision. So as we make these connections between Abram's offer, this, the, the temple, and then Christ dying on that same mountain, what are the connections? What does this reveal? Excuse me. What does this reveal about God? What does this reveal about God? He's sovereign. He's sovereign? Sovereign how so? Yeah, consistent providing, okay? 
But, but follow this other track here. He's sovereign. How is he sovereign? How do we see that he's sovereign? He's absolute owner and ruler moving through these events. Sorry? Yes, he orchestrated. He told Abram to go to that place. He told Solomon to bear that place. And he himself came and died on that same mountain. He orchestrated and brought all of those events together in one, other, in one incredible place, right? Okay, what other character of God do we see through this, through, as we make these connections? And he knows exactly what he will do. <laughs> he knows exactly what he will do, isn't it? Isn't he intimately involved with mankind? He's not a distant God who's just spun the world and got it going and left it to run on its own. He's intimately involved in all of it. How about his design and his order to orchestrate all of these events, to, make the, to, to orchestrate the most significant events in history of mankind on one mountain? Isn't it incredible? This is who our God is. We looked at his order, we looked at his order and, and his design and creation, but look through at his order and his design and all of the events of history as he brings it down to his son dying on that mountain and, uh, and, uh, for us. It's amazing how God has taken us to the same place as Abram did to receive his provision. Do you ever make that connection? The place that God took Abram to offer his son and receive God's provision, God has now taken us to that same mountain in the person of Jesus Christ because that's where our substitute lamb died in our place. God has taken us to that same mountain. Is it just a coincidence? As a result, we've escaped our bondage to sin, Satan, and the lake of fire. So as we make these connections and seeing, and seeing his provision, that God alone provided our rescue, as pictured in the Lamb who died in Isaac's place, what's our response? How do we respond to that? What comes to mind? What do we do as these things begin to come together and we see our God in his provision for us? What's our response? Worship, Worship isn't it? Worship for what? How do we worship? What well, words come to mind as we ascribe worth and we lift up his name? What are we lifting up his name for? Security. Security. What else are we lifting up his name for? Thankfulness. Thankfulness, Thankfulness in what? And redeeming, and redeeming us. How else do we worship him? What other words come to mind as we worship him for what he's provided? The louder we praise, the more people hear. Yep, the louder we praise, the more people hear. But thinking of his character as we lift him, what characteristics are we lifting up and are we ascribing worth to God over these connections, his provision? His faithfulness. His faithfulness. How about his grace? How about his grace? See, we can kind of rush through all of these stories, but not just pause long enough to see God in the midst of it. This is his story. It's not about Isaac. It's not about Abraham. It's about God. God is the provider. God is the one who's absolute. God is the one that declared it. God is the one that provided. God is, from start to end, he's the one that's in charge. He's the one that's moving and orchestrating all of these events. He's the one that provided it. Isn't he incredible? Let's just pause for a moment just to thank him for his provision. Kevin, would you just thank God for it? Let's just pray for a second, and let's just worship him in prayer and just say thank you for what he's provided. Let's just not rush past this point. Amen. 
think about as Abraham, as Abraham and Isaac went down off that went down off of that mountain. What do you think they were walking? What do you think their walk was like? I think they were dancing. You think they were dancing down that mountain? Were they hooping and they were hollering at God's provision? So then if we as believers understand and appreciate what Christ did as our Lamb of God, what's our response? Should we not be hooping and hollering too, as much as Mennonites can do that? Should we not be having a skip in our step that we have a God who's provided for our greatest need? The incredible thing is, for those that are unbelievers, God makes that same, that God makes that same offer to, to every unbeliever. He, too, has provided his substitute lamb to die in our place, in your place, if we have not trusted and repented of our sin. There's nothing that we can do apart from Christ that will be good enough as our substitute. Only God was sufficient. Christ died in our place once and for all. The challenge, if we've not put our faith in the finished work of Christ, will we trust him? All we need to do is to repent of our sin, acknowledging his holiness, admitting our sin against him, rejecting our own way, and trusting what Christ has provided. And God, too, then his lamb, his substitute lamb, will be our provision and our rescue. God alone provided our rescue as pictured in the lamb that died in Isaac's place. I don't know, as, as I'm kind of walking through these lessons, I don't know what your heart is doing, but, but just, it's just coming in wave after wave of God's goodness, isn't it? As we just understand his provision, as we just understand how much he's provided, that when he said on the cross, it is finished, it wasn't just our sin. He dealt with everything that separated us, didn't he? He's drawn us into his praise. He's both just And he's also the justifier. He's the one that's just, and he's the one who's made us just so that we meet his standard, that we can be accepted by him. He's our complete provision from first to last. We have nothing more to add. We have nothing more to add, nor can anything undo his provision in our life. Amen? Amen. He is is so good. God declares believers to be as holy as he is the very moment they repent and trust Christ. It's a one-time and permanent. Um, God alone provided a rescue as pictured of the lamb that died in Isaac's place. That's lesson number 11, Lot, Isaac, and Christ.